this morning we will have the, um, we'll have the conference by Rob Hopkins, and I don't want to put so much pressure on the Rob shoulders, but basically that's probably the most important part of our week. Because Rob Hopkins is one of the top, we can call it maybe the, the Pope of transition. Rob Hopkins is a co-founder of Transition Towns and Transition Network, the author of The Power of Just Doing Stuff, The Transitions Handbook, The Transitions Companion. In 2012, he was voted one of the independent top 100 environmentalists and was on Nesta and the Observer's List of Britain 50 New Radicals. Hopkins has also appeared on the BBC Radio 4's Four Thoughts and a good read in the French film Phenomenon Demain and its sequel Après Demain, and has spoken at TEDx Global and also TEDx Events. His next book is From What Is to What If. From What, if, what Is to What If. I just want to quote just very quickly a part of the book. What if, if you could swim safely in all London's canals? What if all residential streets were play streets? What if every street had public art? What if, if bird song drowned out of traffic noise? What if there were more trees than people? What if, if a squirrel could get from one side of London to the other without touching the ground by jumping from tree to tree? What if we had vertical climbable commons? What if majestic red kites fill London skies again? What if could see the Milky Way from every garden? What if we, we wide all the London's golf courses? What if every park in London were connected to all its neighboring parks by at least one green quiet way suitable for walking, cycling, and gardening too? Please welcome on stage Rob Hopkins. Good morning. I can't see anybody at all. There we are. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, so I'm going to start today by asking you to do something for me, one little exercise that I would like to do. So if you could, you need to be in a pair with somebody for this. So if you could just have a quick look around, decide who your partner is going to be. OK, Does this, can I use this? Is that okay? Okay, everybody has a partner. So I am going to show you an object. And you will have one and a half minutes with your partner to think of as many alternative uses for that object as possible. Okay? This is not school. Well, it is school, but for this exercise, this is not school. There is no right answer to this question. So you are just going, uh, it could be a house for a, for a mouse. It could be a... Uh, duh, 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 duh. Just as many ideas as you can think of in a minute and a half. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Okay, so your object is my shoe. <laughs> One and a half minutes, go. Could you just put the lights up?
Okay, thank you very much for doing that. So, um, did anybody have any ideas that you thought of where you thought, that was so brilliant, I really hope he asks us to share that with everybody? No? <laughs> anybody have a, have a particularly brilliant use for my shoe? No? <laughs> I often do this with, uh, with a paper cup, like a coffee cup. And I did this in Sweden, and this woman said, I would use it to keep the darkness in, which troubled me great, greatly. I couldn't sleep for a few weeks. And then somebody pointed out that in Sweden, there is uh, a month in the year where it's light all the time, and it might be quite nice to have a little bit of darkness in the house, and I felt a lot better uh, after that. So I want to talk to you today about imagination, and, and uh, uh, as Xavier said, I just wrote a book, so I've spent the last two years doing a lot of thinking, uh, thank you, about imagination. And I want to start out just with a little bit of what uh, Extinction Rebellion, the movement about climate change, would call tell the truth. That we need to start, I think, our reflections on, on the future always with, uh, with, with a, a, a clear and honest take on where we find ourselves globally at the moment. So the biggest uh, ice core that has ever been uh, extracted, which gives us a really accurate record of CO2 concentrations back through time, allows us to look back 2.2 million years and see how the climate has changed over that time. During that time, everything that we associate with, uh, with human culture, human civilization, has emerged within a, with, with, within a band where the climate has fluctuated, but within, a small, uh, within small variations. The, the, the highest level of concentration of CO2 within that has been 300 parts per million. This year we are at 412 uh, parts per million. We are seeing things happen around the world, the fires in Australia, what's happening with the ice, uh, and so on and so on, which are way ahead of the scenarios that, uh, that, that climate scientists have been putting out. We know that a one and a half degree increase in, in global climate will lead, to a, uh, will, will lead to food shortages across the world. We know that two and a half degrees, uh, a three, that, that, sorry, that a three degree increase will lead to billions of people dying around the world. Four degrees, four, five, six degrees, that's kind of the end of life on this planet really. And at the moment, we will be hitting uh, 1.5 degrees by 2025. We'll be hitting 2 degrees by 2035 and 4 to 6 degrees by about 2070. That's the target that we're on at the moment. And that's, that's, that's uh, appalling. And so David Wallace Wells, who wrote a book called The Uninhabitable Earth, he said, uh, as he said in that book, uh, when it comes to climate change, we suffer from an incredible failure of imagination. The future generations look back and say, really? You couldn't figure that out? It wasn't that hard. It wasn't that big a challenge. And actually what's happened is we've procrastinated and procrastinated. So having done a little bit of tell the truth, in terms of the scale of the challenge, I really want to impress on you, business as usual is absolutely not an option anymore, at all. This is a time when imagination is utterly vital uh, to our survival. So, but I don't want, I'm not going to give you an hour of gloom and doom and, uh, and how terrible things are. My work for many years has been about what do we do about it? What do we do in the places where we live, with the people where we have? What do we do? This is me about 12 years ago at the very beginning of a project in my town where we started to plant nut trees uh, in our parks, in our public spaces, and we got our, our mayor to come along and put some walnuts on the end of a spade, and we started a project. And, and over this talk, you'll see where this has gone since we started this whole thing uh, in 2005, 2006. About four months ago, I went to London, where there was the global strike. I'm sure some of you here will have been involved in the, in, in the school strikes for climate that, uh, that have been taking place, started with Greta Thunberg about a year ago and have now spread all around the world. This was, I think, in October, when there was the global strike, when the young people said, OK, we've been doing this now for eight or nine months. We need, we need the adults to come and support us here. 
And so many people took the day off work, they went on strike themselves, and they went out to support the young people. This was at Westminster, 100,000 people, mostly young people, a fantastic energy to it. And the thing that I would really invite you to do today is to, is to ask with me this kind of what-if question of what if that was the day when, we, when, when the world tipped in direction around the climate issue? Because for many of us who've worked on climate change for years, it's been really hard work. It's been like pushing a car that's broken down up a hill. It's exhausting. And gravity is always against you. The culture is against you. You're trying to do something against the cultural narrative. I think at the moment we are kind of at the top of the hill. And what, what it would feel like to go down the other side will feel very, very different. And this was a day to me where I thought, what if today, this day was the day that... that that it tipped. So I, what, I want to, in what I want to do today is to, is, is to take you on a bit of a thought experiment into what that might look like. This is the only graph I will show you all day, don't worry. But I show you this not so much for the maths, but for the story. Because for me, since in 2005, 2006, in my small town, we started an experiment which has spread and spread, and you can now find transition groups in 50 countries around the world, and there's even one here in this university as well, uh, that actually, it has always struck me that the most important thing is, how do we tell the stories about the bottom part of this graph that create longing? that create, that, that, that make us really hungry for that low-carbon future. What would a low-carbon future be like? Would it be just living in a cave, eating moldy potatoes and being cold all the time? Or actually, could it be fantastic and so much better than what we have now? A world of better food and better beer and better conversation uh, and more beautiful places and cities we can breathe in and so on and so on. And unless we can create the longing and tell the stories about how that future could be, it's never going to happen. After all, in 1969, when man first set foot on the moon, Actually, human beings had been going to the moon for 50 or 60 years already in stories, in songs, in films. We had, we had, sort of, we had told stories and imagined going to the moon for a long time before we went. And often when we try to inspire and engage people around climate change, we show them images like this. And for some people that works. Some people can see an image like that and go, right, I need to do something. We need to change things. I need to make some change happen. But actually, that doesn't really work for everybody. And my concern is that when people are very frightened, their, their imaginations contract, their imagination shrinks. How would it be instead if we told stories about how that future could be? This is an artist called James Mackay who draws the future. This is his drawing of what a city could look like if we actually uh, created the best conditions for biodiversity. Our cities were full uh, of biodiversity in a way that is presently unimaginable. What if our cities were places where food grew everywhere and our children's experience of walking to school every day was to walk through food being grown and that was a part of our life? After all, at the moment in our cities, we give over an enormous amount of space to cars. In Los Angeles, two-thirds of the surface area of Los Angeles is dedicated to cars. When we're able to move beyond the car, that's a lot of space that we need to do imaginative things with. And we already see a bit in Paris and in some cities where land is taken back from the car, it opens up a whole imaginative conversation about what should happen here. So for me, it's really important that we're able to generate stories and tell stories about what it could be. So I just want to show you a short little film that I made as a promotion for the book, which is kind of what, what happens in my head when I take a walk through the, what the future would be like in 2030. This is my apartment. I wake up here and get my kids up ready for school. Come on kids! These apartments were built 14 years ago with straw bale walls and using local materials. They're incredibly energy efficient. And the composting toilets in the basement mean that we now use a fraction of the water that we used to use in 2019. 
The streets are quiet due to sparse motorised traffic, aligned with fruit and nut trees. There are food gardens everywhere and the air smells like spring. I drop my kids at school. Bye kids, see you later. School is now very different from 15 years ago. Testing was eliminated, play is encouraged, and the great reskilling means that kids can now turn their hands to pretty much anything. I call in to buy bread at my favourite bakery. This place was set up in 2022 as part of a citywide holistic mental health strategy based on the idea that baking is the new Prozac. I pass former supermarkets now repurposed as a flourishing mix of local enterprises. Many of the enterprises here are run by people who arrived during the time of the Great Migrations and who are now so fully integrated it's really hard to remember life before they came. I walk down streets full of children playing, neighbours in conversation, people growing food everywhere. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I visit a meeting run by our municipality's Civic Imagination Office which has transformed local democracy and what feels possible to us as citizens of this place. As the day draws to a close, I notice the hooting of owls and the swooping of the bats, just two of the indicators that the biodiversity of this place is really starting to bounce back. So all of those were, were photos I've taken in different projects that I've been to visit uh, across Europe. So at this, but at this point, you might be thinking, well, you know, Rob, we're, we're, we're business students. Uh, this, is all a bit, this is all a bit fantastical, uh, idealistic stuff. Well, the beauty of what I do is I get to go and visit places where this is already happening. This is already happening all over the world. So uh, uh, last year I went to visit uh, a place uh, which is just north uh, from Nice, Montsartu. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right. Anyway, that place. And uh, there, uh, a few years ago, the French government said uh, that 20% of all school food had to be organic. And here they said, well, if 20% is better than 0%, why, why do we stop at 20%? So now 100% of all of the food in the schools, all the schools is organic, and they grow 70% of that food uh, in a garden which the municipality started on the edge of the town. They have uh, big tunnels to grow food. They have the biggest spinach I have ever seen in my life. Uh, and, it's a, and it was just for me, as somebody who has spent 12 or 13 years with a kind of vision in my head that I try to excite people about, to go and visit that place and see it in reality was really, really uh, moving for me. And they have a building where they train young people how to cook, how to grow food. Solutions like this are a win-win-win-win-win-win-win scenario. They're good for biodiversity, good for public health, good for mental health, good for the local economy. They're good for everything. And so many of the strategies that we need, if we can bring imagination to think about the climate crisis, uh, are, 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 are the same as that. So, about three years ago, I came across some research that was done in the US in uh, 2010 where the researcher looked at the, something called the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking. It's the kind of gold standard creativity test. And uh, they, they, were, they had done this going back in the 1960s, going back to the 1960s, and it's tests very similar to what you just did with my shoe. How many different uses can you think of for an object? Her conclusion was that imagination and IQ rose together until the mid-1990s, and then IQ kept rising, and imagination went into what she called a steady and persistent decline. And when this was published, it was a really big story in the US. It was on the front page of Newsweek magazine. It was, there was lots of soul-searching about, what does this mean for economic growth? What does this mean for Hollywood and Pixar? And within the US, there was a real concern that we're becoming less creative, and that's one of, our main, uh, one of the main things that we have to offer the world. But actually, I never heard anyone in the climate change, social justice, ecological movement say, what does this mean for us? And so that's really my starting point. Are we at this time in history when our survival depends on us being as imaginative as we can possibly be, living in a time where we are creating the conditions for our imagination actually to be contracting? So this, this talk today is, uh, you could think of it as being like a long love poem to two words, what if. And I'm going to share nine what if questions with you. 
So the first of those questions is, what if we took play seriously? Because one of the things that this researcher identified as one of the main reasons that imagination is shrinking is the decline of play. And uh, it used to be... Um, oops, excuse me. It used to be that our streets were full of children playing. The former mayor of Bogota used to say that we should look at the number of children playing in the street as one of the key well-being indicators of any city. And actually our streets now have been largely purged of children playing. But when children played like this, they had a whole culture that adults knew nothing about. This was how children learned to cooperate, to manage conflict, to take risks. When we create a generation of young people who don't take risks, we create a generation of adults who can't take risks, which is the last thing that we need to be creating today. So when I was researching the book, I thought, where can I find a place where people are starting to create the conditions for children to play again? And I visited the city of Bristol uh, in the southwest of England where they have a project called Playing Out which helps communities to close their streets so that children can come out and play in those streets. And uh, I visited a street on a Wednesday evening and it's full of children playing and drawing with chalk on the street. I spoke to one of the mothers who said, well, we just got rid of the cars and then all the children played. You know, once you create the space, the children will naturally play. I spoke to one father on the street who said, after a few months, we found that we actually quite liked each other. So you could see the, the neighbours, the, the people starting to find each other again and connect to each other. In my own town, we had a, a festival of street games where we closed uh, a street and we invited people to come and share games they played as children uh, with children now. It was fantastic seeing that, that, that for the first half, the adults kind of stood around the side saying, yeah, this is really good, my children are playing. And then the second half, they were like, oh, I'm going to play too and ended up with everybody all playing together. It was fantastic. And there was one of the games that I'd never heard of before that is just fantastic, is this Dutch game called Spekerpupen. I'm, sure I'm sure there might be anybody here from, from the Netherlands who can, has a better pronunciation of that than I do. But this is a beautiful game. You get a piece of string, you tie it onto the back of your trousers or your skirt, and you, have, you put a nail on it hanging to about there. You put a bottle behind you, and you have to try and kind of, you have to get the nail looking, just looking backwards into the bottle. Fantastic. This, this girl played this game for about 10 minutes. If any of you are parents and you ever wonder, worry about your children's attention span or they're too noisy, just give them this game to you. Maybe you could use this in staff meetings here at the university. Uh, it's a really wonderful game. But bringing play back is so important. But increasingly, play is something that we buy and something that we buy for our children, and which allows me to introduce this hideous monstrosity, uh, which is called Hello Barbie. And uh, Hello Barbie, my, she, this is my Hello Barbie, and so she travels with me a lot in my bag, so her hair doesn't look as good as it did in, in the picture. She's turning into kind of punk Barbie, really, at this stage. But Hello Barbie is the world's first smart Wi-Fi doll who has conversations with your children uh, and Mattel record all of the answers and use them to build a detailed marketing profile of your child, which it can then buy and sell with other companies. And when this was launched in 2015, there was an American uh, campaign called the, the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood who, uh, who campaigned against this. They ran a campaign called Hell No Barbie, which led to a 90% reduction in sales uh, and they argued, this is an attack on your child's imagination. This will kill your child's family of imaginary friends. And uh, uh, they, and so what I wanted to be able to do was to interview Hello Barbie on stage for her opinions about the imagination in 2019. But I can't do that because the app was discontinued. But there is a, but you can get the script. And at one point in the script, she says, so now that we've used our imaginations and played games, let's talk about something really important, fashion. In Germany, dolls like this have been classified by the German government as illegal espionage apparatus. And parents can be fined for putting batteries into these things. 
So are we creating the best conditions for our children's imagination to flourish? Actually, if you give them a, a cardboard box or a pile of leaves and some twigs, they can turn that into anything. You can't turn this into anything other than what it is. Uh, this man here is uh, a man called Ant Ant Antanas Mokas. And uh, he was the mayor of Bogota in Colombia twice. And this was how he ran. This was how he, how he campaigned to become the mayor of Bogota as a superhero called Super Citizen. And, uh, and I was really interested in where I could find politicians who valued play and imagination. So he, when he was elected, he said, here's what I learned. People respond to humor and playfulness from politicians. It's the most powerful tool for change we have. When he became the mayor of Bogota, they had the highest number of deaths on the road in that city uh, and the most corrupt traffic police. So he sacked the entire traffic police department and instead he hired a team of 400 mime artists who stood on all the main intersections dressed like this and they had a red and a yellow card like a football referee and if a car behaved badly they'd get shown a red card. He said, the one thing Colombians fear more than the traffic police is public humiliation. And uh, the number of deaths fell by 50%. And I just love that idea that we start to bring play back very visibly uh, into our public life. So, my second what-if question. What if we considered imagination vital to our health? We think all too often of imagination as being something which is a bit of a luxury, it's a, sort of a, it's a nice thing to have, but it's not really vital. I would argue that for human mental health, having a flourishing imagination is absolutely vital. This is a part of your brain called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a part of your brain where your imagination and your memory uh, fire from. The thing that's most interesting about the hippocampus is that when we are, it is the part of the brain that is uniquely vulnerable to cortisol when we are anxious or in trauma or in stress, the hippocampus can shrink by up to 20%. And when it shrinks, we lose that ability to, to see and to think about the future in hopeful and positive ways, which feels to me like what's happening uh, more widely uh, as a society. So I was really interested to see where can I find a place where the hippocampus is being kind of rebuilt, a kind of a campus for the hippocampus, if you like. So I went to Dundee in Scotland and visited an amazing project there called Art Angel. And this is the woman who runs it. They're in an office block on, uh, on the first floor in the centre of Dundee in Scotland, a very poor city, lots of social problems. And they, uh, they say, when you come here, you're not a patient or a client, you are an artist. <clears throat> and you are preparing work for an exhibition. And every year they put on an exhibition in the main gallery in Dundee. And I spoke to many people who were there who had had very difficult time and for whom Art Angel had transformed their ability to be imaginative. You could see people reimagining who they were because who they were before really didn't work. So, they, uh, so I spoke to one woman. She said, I spent the last four years in my pajamas. Six months ago, I came that close to ending my own life. And I've come here for six months and now I can see the future again. I want to go to college. I want to do things. <clears throat> and it's because they were, uh, the, the art is a beautiful way to, to invite people back and rebuild their imagination. Every year, they have to do, a, they do an evaluation of how well they're doing. They don't give people a big questionnaire. They give them a piece of paper with two outlines of a human body. And they say, fill the first one in to show how you felt before you came here. And fill the second in to show how you feel now that you've been coming to Art Angel. I looked through a big pile of these. It was really, really moving. And I'm just going to show you one which kind of, for me, captures what the transition of the next 10 or 15 years will need to feel like. So my third one. <clears throat> what if we fought back to reclaim our attention? We have these extraordinary devices <coughs> in our pockets, these extraordinary phones which allow us to do so much, but which are also wreaking enormous damage, I think, to our attention and our ability to concentrate. And when, as a culture, we are unable to sustain our attention, I think that has a real knock-on impact <coughs> on our imagination. Oh, no, hang on, I've dropped the wrong way around. 
Sorry, I'll come back to that one in a minute. I need to do this one first. We'll do attention in a second. Uh, so this is about nature. So most of the, the most imaginative people in our culture historically get their imagination from, from time in nature. But we're living in a time when, when the diversity of the natural world around us is contracting. During my lifetime, <clears throat> or since the Beatles split up, if you want to look at it like that, we've lost 70% of the creatures that we share this planet with. 70% of the creatures we share this planet with. That's not an accident, that's an extermination. And I think that when we live in a world where the diversity of the wildlife around us is shrinking, that has a real impact on our imagination. The microbiologist René Dubot used to say, if we lived on the moon, our imagination would be as barren as the moon. But when we live in a time where we hear less birds and we see less butterflies and we see less bees, I think that has a, has a, has a harmful impact on our imagination as well. This is, a, in London, a geographer called Daniel Raven Ellison who uh, took his son to visit all the national parks in the UK. And he came back and he made this map of London. He was a geographer, so he made this map of London. This is London with just the green spaces and the blue spaces. This is London with no streets or roads or bridges or buildings. And when he did this, he realised that 49.5% of London is green space and blue space. So he said, if we could add just another half a percent, then the majority of London would be green space and blue space. So it could be a national park. So he started this project called London National Park City. He worked out that was just one square metre for every person in London. That's not too difficult. And it raises a beautiful what-if question of, well, wh wh where is my square meter? Is it gonna, am I going to do it at home or at school or at my place of worship? Or wh wh where, will I, where will I do that? This is now, London has now been designated a national park city. The what-if questions that Xavier read out at the beginning <coughs> were from the, London, from the London National Park City project. And I was really interested to see where could I find places where people are connecting to nature and finding that that actually brings huge benefits and increases the imagination of that community. This is one of my heroes, an amazing woman in Richmond, California, who runs a project there teaching young people to grow food in a really tough neighborhood. They've started 13 farms and gardens throughout that neighborhood. And I said to her, how have you seen over the last 15 years of teaching more and more and more young people how to grow food and to connect to nature, how have you seen that impact on the imagination of the place? She said, when I grew up here, we all just wanted to leave. She said, now I hear lots of young people saying, I want to live here, I want to afford to buy a house here, make my life here. They're dreaming all kinds of things and feeling like it's totally within the realm of possibility. So, attention. If you imagine it's, you're in Arles in 1888, in the little yellow house, and Vincent van Gogh comes into the kitchen and he's carrying a bunch of sunflowers and he arranges them in a little vase on a table and the sun comes in through the window and he sits back and he looks at the flowers and he says, oh, I'll just check my Instagram uh, page and I'm just going to check my Facebook feed and my Twitter uh, and my email, and then two hours later, he's watching videos of skateboarders falling downstairs, and he can't remember why he even started looking at videos of skateboarders falling downstairs. We wouldn't have this picture. This picture would not exist. And all that it has brought to generations and generations of us would not have existed, because this is really distilled attention. If we're unable to focus on something and unable to hold our attention on something, it's really hard to be imaginative. If you, uh, if you think about what are the things you want to achieve in your life over the next five years, you want to finish your studies here, maybe you want to go to different places, you want to do different things, you want to start a company or something, but then think what are the aims that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter have for you for the next five years? It's that you give as much of your attention as possible to that program, to, to, to that platform. There's a real discrepancy there. It's like buying a sat-nav for your car and saying, take me to Paris, and you end up in Nice. You'd want your money back. And we're surrounded by so many things that are distracting us, and our attention span has been declining uh, as a result. And I think that, that, that has a real impact on our ability to be imaginative because we're terrified of being bored, 
And uh, I interviewed a guy who at the, the University of California, Dr. Larry Rosen, and he said, imagination is taking things from other places in your brain, things you've heard, things you've done, things you've seen, and putting them together in unique but valuable ways. We don't have the attention span to do that anymore, and it's not just young people. I would say our imagination is on the decline, exactly in the opposite trend of our time spent on smartphones. What about education? Do we have an education system that young people leave at the age of 18 with their imagination like a superpower? Has your experience of education been that your imagination has been nurtured and you feel uh, really, really imaginative? Or actually, have you spent most of your time at school passing tests? In the UK now, arts is almost being completely removed from, from, from school. Unless you go to a, to a private school, uh, you've, you get very little experience of the arts now. So what if school nurtured young imaginations? This is in Italy, a place called Reggio Emilia, which is a place where at the end of the Second World War, all they had left was a tank and three trucks and six horses that the Germans left behind. And they sold them to build a school based on the idea of how can we have a system of education that will make sure that fascism never happens again. So at the heart of every school is an atelier where you can go at any time of day and someone will help you make something. They have making with your hands at the very heart of that education system. They say that the building itself is the third teacher, so they make schools full of plants and light and beautiful places. They don't teach by subject, they teach by project. You work on projects, the school is really there to help you. In their philosophy of how they teach, they describe children as being beautiful, powerful, competent, creative, curious, and full of potential and ambitious desires, and authors of their own learning. I never went to a school that looked at me like that. And I wonder how different the world would be if we had more schools like that. So I, in, the, in the book, I, visit, I talk to many different schools around the world where they are trying to put imagination at the front, trying to be the most imaginative schools. This is a school in a city near where I live called Plymouth. And Plymouth is a quite a poor city, and uh, they, have a, they have a really great art college. And the people in the art college were noticing that young people were coming at 16 and 17, and after a few weeks they'd say, we love it here. And they say, why? Why do you love it so much? They said, because we've spent the last 12 years trying to pass tests and trying to guess the right answer in our teacher's head. And actually, this is the first creative things we've done in 12 years. So the, so the, the art college said, what would it be like if we made a school that went from 4 to 16 that was like an art school? Kind of an art college for 5, 6, 7, 10, 12-year-olds. So they built this building called the Red House uh, in the middle of Plymouth. And originally they wanted to do it in a big old uh, shop in the centre of Plymouth. They couldn't do it. But their brief to the architects was, they said, it needs to have no corridors. It should have no room that resembles a cell designed for 30 inmates. It should have specialist performance and studio spaces. Build us a shop that we can occupy as a school. So when you enter the school in, in, the, in the ground floor, they have an atelier, a food atelier, where young people learn to grow food, to, to, to cook food. And this is the classroom. The classrooms are like the studios uh, in an art school. It's an extraordinary place. And I think we need to be absolutely, with huge urgency, uh, reimagining our education system. Because at the moment, it's completely unfit for purpose uh, for young people coming into the world that we're actually living in. What if we became better storytellers? What if rather than when we had a conversation about climate change, we just talked about how depressing it was and how awful it was, within that conversation we also always talked about what could happen instead? The kind of world I talked about at the beginning. If we could make space for, for, for being really good at telling the stories of how, how that would be. This is uh, two researchers at the University of Plymouth called Jackie Andrade and John May. And they developed something called functional imagery training, which is a way of uh, helping people who want to change something in their life. So if you're overweight or you want to stop drinking so much or you want to change something, then they work with you to say, we're going to help you to really imagine it with all your senses. What would it smell like and sound like and feel like if you had made those changes? 
So if you're so to imagine yourself exercising or getting out of the shower after you've run or something like that, but to really imagine it, what would it smell like and sound like? And they find that it really, really works. People make a change and they stick with that change, and they call it creating memories of the future. So in terms of climate change, in terms of the ecological crisis, how do, we create, how do we create memories of the future where we had done everything that we could possibly do? The guy, those drawings I showed you at the beginning were done by this man. He was called James Mackay. And this is him. He, he lives in Leeds, at the, works at the University of Leeds. He goes out into the streets and he draws the city. And as people walk past, he says, excuse me, how do you think this place might be in the future? And then he adds those stories into his drawing. He says, you just need a very simple sketch. What interested me most was that he said that when he, before he did this work, he was very, very pessimistic about the future. And now, having done this work for five or ten years, he feels so much more hopeful and positive and like, actually, there are things that, that, that we can do. So when we think about the future uh, and the role of storytelling, art is really important to that because it's not just about literally drawing the future like this. It's also about maybe finding ways to give people a feeling. What would it feel like? How would it be? And there's an, uh, an illustrator called Quentin Blake in the UK. He does children's books. He was invited to Angers in France to the, to the maternity hospital, and uh, he drew a series of murals on the wall, which he described as being a celebration of what's going to happen and a reassurance that that's what will happen. I'm just going to show you three of those. They're just beautiful, and they and 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 you know what what would the versions of this be for 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 a kind of a low carbon future? So, what if we started asking better questions? What if we became really really good at asking questions that started with the words "what if"? And I want to show you, I've, I've tell you a couple of stories of really good what-if questions. So in London, in Tooting, in South London, it's a part of London with lots of busy traffic. There's nowhere that's like a, a, a village, like a green or a town square, like a public space. There's one place it could be, which is this place, which is, a bu which is full of buses all the time, waiting to be called to go somewhere else. The air quality is horrible. It's a spot that you really wouldn't want to stay in very long. But so Transition Town Tooting said, what if that was our space? What if that was the people's space if it was a, a, a village green? So one day last year, they took over that space and they turned it into what it could be like. So they filled that space with food and flowers. They put grass, down, real grass down on the ground. Uh, it was filled with music and conversation. It was fantastic. I spent the whole day there. And as the day went on, I'm, I got to put my feet on the green, green grass of tooting. It was just wonderful. And uh, over the day, I heard the conversation change from, if this was our village green, to when this is our village green, blah, 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 blah. The sense of permission underneath it all started to change. It was really amazing. And I look, people started to look at this wall. This is possibly the most boring wall in all of London. And nobody would ever look at this wall normally because they would just be walking. And I heard so many people say, when this is our village green, what will we paint on that wall? What story about ourselves will we want to paint on that wall? So there's something about creating that kind of what-if space that can really start to change the permission of what we think is possible. This is in Liège, in Belgium, and uh, Liège en Transition started about six years ago, and they started a project five years ago called Centure Alimentaire. The idea was they had a what-if question. What if, in one generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège was grown on the land closest to Liège? And I went to the event where they launched this, and they had farmers and academics and chefs and baristas and anyone who cared about food in Liège came to this event based around this what-if question. And then I didn't really hear very much, and then I went back last March. And in that four years, they had created 21 new cooperatives in Liège. They had raised 5 million euros 
of investment from local people. They raised two and a half million euros to start a vineyard called Van de Liege. And I met the organizer. I said, how did you have the confidence to raise two and a half million euros for a vineyard? And he looked at me puzzled. He said, it's Belgium. People like wine. People have some money. Don't be afraid. So I passed that advice on. You know, Actually, they're, they're, so it's because they had a really, really great narrative. They started these, this shop called Les Petits Producteurs in the center of Liège, selling the food from local farmers. Within six months, it was doing so much better than its business plan. They opened another one. Then they opened a third. Now this first one has doubled in size. The man at the top is called Pascal, and he manages Les Petits Producteurs. And uh, I said, what's the potential of this? How far can this go? He said, I think by the time we have 10 of these shops, the supermarkets will start to fragilize. Fragiliser. Not that we need to campaign against supermarkets. and We just build something better, which is more appropriate to local demand. They have a local currency that runs through it all. It's a fun, they have a, a brasserie, a brewery, which I had to go and visit. You know, we all have to make sacrifices. And, uh, and I met the mayor of Liège, who said, this is now the story of our city. We see our role as a municipality just to remove any blockages to this happening. All the land we own around the city we're making available to Centure Alimentaire. They're now doing a project where they're looking at the hospitals and the schools and how that can connect in with how the city feeds itself. But it all started with a really great what-if question that had a big invitation in it for people to come and be part of something uh, historic. So my penultimate question, which I have to say, coming from the UK at the moment, feels like a really difficult one. What if our leaders prioritized the cultivation of imagination? Every government comes in and says, we're going to have a national innovation strategy. Well, where's the national imagination strategy? If we're living in a time where our imagination is, is, is shrinking because of the conditions we're creating for it, how, do we, how, how, do we, how can government help to rebuild that capacity in its citizens? One way, I think, is, by, is through the use of citizens' assemblies, which have been used so powerfully. There's one happening, I think, here about climate change that Cyril Dion is part of, which is around climate change. In Ireland, they use citizens' assemblies and kind of deliberative democracy as a way of uh, looking again at same-sex marriage and abortion and, and these kind of things. But bringing in a different kind of democracy can really help with the imagination. Um, in Barcelona, which I think is politically one of the most imaginative cities in the world, they have neighborhood assemblies all across that city. Every neighborhood meets and makes recommendations to the city government for policy, as a result of which uh, there's so many amazing, fascinating things happening in Barcelona now. How could we create an economic framework for our towns and cities that invite the imagination? This is a city in the UK called Preston, which has created a different economic model, which is like the transition movement on a, on a bigger scale. Their model is to say, how do we make sure that the money that comes into this city does as much as possible and circulates as much as it can before it leaves? Uh, that they, they, in 2011, they'd run out of ideas. The city had no money. They, uh, they, they looked at the money they did spend and said, where does it go? And found that only 4% of it was spent into the economy of the city. The rest of it all left. So they said, how do we change the economy so more money will stay here? And they do it by looking at the hospitals, the universities, the schools, uh, the municipality, and how they spend their money. So they spend their money in a way that drives the local economy. They brought their pension funds back to the city and used them to build things. It's an amazing story. They're one of the most improved cities in the, in the country. They've made 12,000 new jobs there just in the last few years. PricewaterhouseCooper do an analysis every year of the most improved city in the country and this year it was Preston because they are creating spaces in which people can, can be imaginative and those ideas are taken seriously. This woman here is called Gabriela Gomez Mont. She's incredible. She works for the mayor of Mexico City where she created within that administration something which was conceived of as being a ministry of imagination which sounds like something out of a Harry Potter book yeah? but actually 
in, 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 uh, in Mexico City, it exists. Half her team are made up of transport planners and architects. The other half are made up of filmmakers and poets and storytellers. And they are responsible for the imaginative life of that city. And when I spoke to her, she said, imagination is not a luxury. We are not only, should not only be thinking about building cities for the human body, but also for the human imagination. The more we distribute the capacity to imagine different futures, the better off we will be. And in Bologna, in Italy, they've created what they call the Civic Imagination Office. The Civic Imagination Office sits between the municipality and the people, and it works like a transition group to try and invite and support the imagination of that place, helping them to vision and dream. What could this place be like? They found that the number of people voting was declining and people were just disengaged, so they went for this approach. What's different and interesting about in Bologna is that when the community come up with great ideas, they, the municipality create pacts with them. They say, okay, that's a great idea. Okay, we can offer you some funding and some support and insurance and whatever else you need. What can you offer? You can offer time and people and whatever. Okay, let's make a pact. In the last five years in Bologna, they've created 500 pacts between the municipality and the community, which range from making a garden in a street through to taking over an office block and turning it into a school to train young people to become classical musicians. They recognize that putting the community's imagination at the heart of what they do as a municipality is the best way to move forward. It's a, I think every city should have an, a civic imagination office. And maybe we should have a National Imagination Act Maybe we need a, 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 to, to enshrine the right to an imaginative life in policy. There is a beautiful act in Wales, the Welsh government created, called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which says every publicly funded body has to set out how it's going to create the best conditions for the imagination of the people who work within it. How extraordinary it would be to have a national imagination act. It would mean that if the government wanted to impose austerity, it wouldn't be able to because that is, a, that is an assault on the collective imagination. So, my very last what-if question. What if all of this came to pass? What would it be like to live in a time when imagination was everywhere and anything felt possible? It feels really kind of outside of our experience. There are times in history that I talk about in the book when actually that was the case, but it certainly hasn't really been for quite a while. And, and in the transition movement, that's what we try to do, is to create those spaces that, uh, in communities where people come together, they work with their local governments sometimes, they work with local businesses sometimes, <coughs> and sometimes they don't, and they start projects which start to bring that vision of the future that we talked about at the beginning, to bring it into now, to bring it into the present. So people can see it and taste it and smell it. It could be small things like making a garden in a street or uh, making wine with other people. It could be bigger things like we're going to open a shop. It could be we're going to start a community energy company. It could be a project like in Liège where they are reimagining how that city will feed itself. But what's important is that all of those projects exist now and they give people a taste and they start to move us towards it. And just to give you a couple of examples, in London... In Crystal Palace, which is a neighborhood in London, the transition group started, um, started a market, a food market. They said, what if this place had a food market that created new opportunities for people, that, 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 that brought better food into the city? They've won every award in the city for, for, for best food market. And I said to them, why do you do this? And they said, we do this because we want our children to grow up thinking that this is normal. And so a lot of what we do in transition is to try and take these things and, and really try and make them normal. One of my favorite things they do there is to say, well, rather than having a farm, because we're in a city, we don't really have a farm, but we're going to have a patchwork farm. So we have people and gardens in schools and ch the churches and people's own gardens, and they have one stall in the market where every Saturday they go around and they harvest from all of those places, and that's the food that's for sale. So we don't have a farm, we have a patchwork farm. We look at this neighborhood as being a patchwork farm. This is in uh, Ungersheim in the Alsace, where they have an incredible mayor called Jean-Claude Mensch, who's a really imaginative uh, guy who, has, who's, who saw a film about transition in 2011 and said, let's do that, all of that. 
So when you go to Ungersheim, you start to see what it looks like when all the different strands of a low-carbon economy come together. They have the biggest solar farm in the region. They have all kinds of interesting renewable energy projects. They have a local currency called the radish. They, uh, they are, they, they, all the food in the schools comes from uh, grown in a garden on the edge of the town, which trains young people how to grow food. They have a building there where they then turn a lot of that food into other products. They've created 100 jobs there in the town. Uh, it's just wonderful. When I went to visit there, um, I did feel like the Pope, actually, going to visit, uh, going to visit Ungersheim. And uh, one of the things they did was that they sold the school bus and they bought a horse instead. So the kids get taken to school by horse. And when I was there, I, uh, I did a talk and there was a man who was 70. Uh, and after the talk, he said, oh, Rob, he said, this transition stuff is, is really good. I really like it, but he said, but that horse is a bit much. <laughs> I said, why? What's wrong with the horse? He said, well, he said, the horse feels like we're going backwards. I said, but does it? I said, I was with the children today going to school. They were all smiling from here to here. I hated going to school in a bus when I was a child. You know, can't we bring a bit of magic and something a bit different and something they'll talk about and tell their friends about uh, into everyday life? So the last story that I want to, to, to just leave you with before I wrap up is this is from Brussels. And this is in Mille Bruxelles, which is a, a, a right in the center of Brussels. And this is the red light district. So the people who live on this street experience a lot of the problems of living alongside prostitution, men driving up and down this, this road all night and noise and so on. So the municipality put these two blocks of concrete to stop men driving up and down. And some of the people who lived on this street were part of their local transition group. And they said, we can do better than two blocks of concrete. We'd like to make a garden. So the municipality said, well, we'll give you some money for some wood and stuff. And then one weekend, everybody came and they made this garden. And it contains 13 beds that are a meter by a meter. And each one is looked after by one family. This garden is not going to feed this street. This garden is not going to feed one family on this street. But this garden proved to be the most incredible catalyst for the imagination of this street. For the first time in a street that you would never normally stand still in, or certainly not stop to have a conversation in, people started to gather and meet and have conversations. It became a place where children were playing in the street again for the first time. If you looked out the window, you saw somebody was working in the garden. You thought, oh, it's okay, the children can go and play. About six months after they made this garden, the refugee crisis in Brussels became uh, really, really uh, huge. And so a group of volunteers built, using recycled materials, uh, a place that would feed 2,000 people a day from, from, from reclaimed food, using recycled materials. They had a school and a health center, all built by volunteers. And most of those volunteers were involved in this garden. I said, what gave you the confidence that within two weeks you could build this whole place? They said, that garden. That was our first experience that we could do something and it would make a change. So never underestimate the power of small projects alongside the power of big projects. So I'm just going to leave you with this. One of the things that, that, that came out of the book for me was a way of thinking about what are the things we can do that create a really good space for the imagination? Create the conditions for the imagination to flourish. The first thing is, imagination needs space. <clears throat> we all know in our own lives, when we're stressed or exhausted or overwhelmed, it's really, really hard to be imaginative. So we need to be creating space in our own lives, in our organizations, in our projects, in our university life. Where's the space for the daydreaming? That's why this week is such a wonderful thing to have as part of what you're doing, to have space to think differently. But in our own lives, how do we carve out some space for daydreaming and looking out of the window rather than filling that time with trying to get to the bottom of our Facebook feed? We need places. We need places we can go where the imagination is kind of uh, is, is invited and where different things feel possible from how they look and what's happening there, places that invite us. We need practices, things we do together with the people around us that invite us to be imaginative. And we need pacts because otherwise we're just dreaming all the time. And if, we, if our local government or the organizations we work with actually invite us to create pacts, 
that come out of our being imaginative, we move from a world where we go to a consultation, write something on a post-it note, and when we're finished, it just goes in the dustbin, to a world where we can see that our imagination is really having an impact uh, and really being taken seriously. So I'm, I'm going to just close with a quote, which is from the book, which is my favourite quote, by Neil Gaiman, who's an author. He said, We all, adults and children, have an obligation to daydream. We have an obligation to imagine. It's easy to pretend that nobody can change anything, that we're in a world in which society is huge and the individual is less than nothing, an atom in a wall, a grain of rice in a rice field. But the truth is, individuals change their world over and over. Individuals make the future and they do it by imagining things can be different. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you. That was a great pleasure to, to have your thought about it. Uh, we had a chance to, to discuss, Rob and I, um, just before the conference. Rob mentioned to me that he has decided many years ago to stop uh, flying, actually taking plane. He has decided to become vegetarian as well. Uh, when we have this kind of conference, we probably, what if we all become a Rob Hopkins? Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to call on stage the, the students, the students who prepare the questions. Please uh, join us on stage to start the, the Q&A session with Rob. Thank you, Rob. Please have a seat. Uh, thank you for the talk, and I, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I think you focused a lot, a lot more on uh, what we can do in the future than uh, you know some of the dark sides of what problems we have right now. And I, I thought that was quite fantastic. Um, from my point of view, the question that I had is: um, so we live in a world where things are very fast-paced, and uh, you know we're, we're all trying to get somewhere, and we have we have a lot of pressure to you know, get these grades and get, get to places that we really have to go to. Uh, in, in the midst of this, you talked about, uh, you know, creating play in our life and bringing all that back so that we can kind of uh, change things up and have much more imagination than uh, compared to all the stress that we have. Uh, what do you suggest as private citizens that uh, uh, something that we can do on a small, uh, small scale, you know, obviously many people don't have the time to do it as, as big as you have done it, uh, what can we do on a small scale to kind of start uh, and put this play back into our lives and get that uh, thing going? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. I, I, I feel like um, I feel like the, the like I I'm a father of of, of, of young people as well, and I, I feel like the the level of pressure that is put on young people today is really kind of unacceptable, and. Uh, and and it, and it really troubles me actually. So 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 you have my sympathies for that. I th I I feel like um, I guess if there was something I would do, I I would say to try and see maybe if you could have a day a week, maybe if you make Sunday a day where you just put your phone in a drawer, and you put your computer in a drawer, and you make some space to to be outside and to walk and to be outside and do things and maybe. 
If you had a group of friends who maybe were here at, at this talk who felt the same, that maybe you might think, well, what could we do on Sundays? What, how, what, what could, we, could we get together and play? I was part of the research for the book. I went to do a, a course in, in improv, improvising theater. Such fun. Like, as an adult, learning to play again, it was just glorious. So maybe that would be my thing, you know, to, to, to have a Sunday where you put your phone in the drawer and you go and do some improv with other people and you just do some play. Because actually the thing is that it's really important to me to, to not sort of think that, well, this is my career and I'm going there and I need to get my career and I need to get all my grades and my imaginative life is somehow not connected to that. You know, in the UK now, the creative industries are 20% of the economy. That's more than the car industry, the aviation industry, life sciences, all of that together. You know, actually, it's one of the things that, 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 that we're good at. And, and, and so to, to, to recognize that if, you, if, if you're going into the workplace as a really, really imaginative person who can make those kind of connections and who can be spontaneous and who can improvise, that's a huge, huge... It's not something normally people would put on their CV, but it's absolutely as, as, as vital to you being a rounded person going out into the world. And particularly, I think, now, where the beautiful thing for me about imagination is that the imagination thrives when it has limits around it. So if I asked you to tell, if I said now, tell me a story, you'd, you'd think, uh, I don't know. If I said, tell me a story about the mouse that lives under this stage and he plays a little tiny little piano, then, you'd, then, then you'd, you'd have limits around it, but you could be more imaginative within that. It's why you know, we use things like a haiku or different literary forms create limits, or when Dr. Seuss wrote a book that just used 50 words, you know, when we put limits around the imagination, we're more imaginative. So the beauty of, 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 of climate change is that when I look at it, I see, when I look at the people who are denying the reality of climate change, Scott Morrison, Donald Trump, people like this, they are the most unimaginative people. And actually, when you put the limits around and you say, okay, we have to learn, figure out how we're going to thrive in the world that can stay below one and a half degrees, that is a huge limit, but the imagination absolutely explodes. And it's what I see in every place that I visit. So putting those limits in place means that we're more imaginative. And if you can go out into the world able to do that, that is such a huge gift uh, to the world, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, generally, I've encountered that the uh, decision maker is resistant to change. They, uh, as a future manager, uh, they are more worried about the profitability. How can we change their mindset? How can uh, how can we uh, how can we make them work out of their comfort zone so that uh, so that we can make a change in uh, what we believe? I think. Um I think, you know, the idea that, that we're living in a world where, where decision makers are not aware of this is really changing very quickly. I feel like deep underneath our feet within the last year, the, the tectonic plates are starting to move uh, in terms of climate change in a way that was kind of unimaginable. Greta Thunberg and the school strikes and Extinction Rebellion and many, many different things have meant that these conversations about climate and, and the scale of what, you know, what we're seeing happening in Australia, for example, you know, that there are many, many people now in, in, in governments, in city governments and regional governments who are really aware of this and who are really trying to figure out what to do and in universities who are trying to figure out what do we do, How, what's our role in this. And this is absolutely the time to be having the conversations that move beyond business as usual. You know, I've, I've kind of done some of that sort of hard work of being considered the sort of lunatic bloke who... The, the guy who says, hey, we could grow food everywhere or whatever. And, uh, and actually now those ideas are becoming mainstream a lot more quickly. You, you go to Paris, the mayor in Paris is creating rooftop gardens all across Paris. And, you know, the, 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 the number of people riding bicycles has increased by 54% in the last couple of years or something. In Paris, you know, these changes are moving. And actually what's needed, I think, is often we don't need to have those fundamental arguments anymore. It's to go in and to see the opportunities and to bring the solutions that are rooted in that new context. Um, 
Thank you for the speech. Uh, I have uh, two small questions. Uh, the first one being, uh, you talked about the project-based uh, education in some of the schools. So like, uh, how can uh, we implement it on a macro level since like most of our uh, education is uh, STEM-based uh, STEM and like result-oriented. So like, how can we change that perception? Like, uh, we have a present perception that grades are everything and like your CV should stand out. So how, how to change that perception? And uh, the second question is, when you started the transition model in 2005, what uh, inspired you to like kind of engage with communities? Because like generally what we hear is like, look at the bigger picture, like look at the macro level picture, but like you started your engagement with small communities coming together. So where did that motivation come from? Uh, thank you. Uh, where did that motivation come from? It came from feeling like that was the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. It felt like that was the piece that nobody was really talking about. That everybody, all the thing was, how do we get governments to change, which is really important. How do we get business to change? That's really important. How do we harness the, the, the power and the potential and the imagination of communities? That wasn't really happening. So it felt like there was something that we could start to move with. And also because it felt like what the world needs now more than anything else is stories. I feel like a lot of my role is, is I'm a kind of a storyteller and I kept capture stories of transition and change and imagination from different places. And actually, in a, in a community, in a town, in a neighborhood, in a city, you can tell those stories really quickly. You know, you can start like when that photo I showed of us at the beginning planting some trees, those were walnut trees. You can grow as much protein uh, and carbohydrate per hectare with, or, with, uh, with those varieties of walnuts as you can with organically grown wheat. And uh, we thought, well, if we can fill our town with walnut trees, we're, we're building food security and biodiversity into the town. So we just planted a few of those in the public place. And then we said, we declare that our town is the nut tree capital of Britain. And people thought we were completely mad. But actually, it was a story. And so far, nobody else has also claimed to be that. So as far as I'm concerned, we still are the nut tree capital of Britain. But for me, that was, that's a, things like that where you can create a story that will really spread is really important. And in terms of STEM, I think it's uh, really important that we, that we move from STEM to STEAM, that we put the arts back in the middle of STEM, uh, and that we have an education system based around STEAM. And the, and, and the, the irony of it is that if you are fortunate enough uh, to go to a private school, uh, they recognize how important the arts are. Most private schools in, in the UK, anyway, have amazing drama departments and amazing art rooms. And they, they really put the arts really central to what they do because they recognize that's how you produce rounded, imaginative, balanced, whole people. But actually, increasingly in the, in the state sector, we, we, we imagine that we can just discard that. That's kind of disposable. So, but there, is a, there are big campaigns now that are moving to say we have to put the arts back at the center. But I think we need to go way beyond that. I think we need to be putting imagination and transition at the heart of schools. You know, I speak to many teachers here in France who work in schools who are trying to make their schools transition schools with food gardens and renewable energy and making that stuff part of their everyday experience, teaching kids how to make stuff. You know, that, that there is within the current curriculum the capacity to do a lot more than, uh, than just do what it says on the piece of paper. Mm. Uh, was getting a bit repetitive, but we just like, thank you for your speech, but not just for that, but for uh, your decades of work. So ESSEC is first and foremost a business school, and uh, most of the people here will become at some point tomorrow's uh, well, managers and leaders. Well, so the school wants us to believe that, but I, I hope it will be true. Uh, a lucky few of us will be leaders of global companies, top French companies or whatnot. Um, so I said you've given so much, now maybe it's time for us to give a little back, more than just claps and cheers. Uh, if there was a wish that we could grant you in 20 years, when uh, some of us will be in these companies, uh, what would it be? Oh, great question. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I think my, my, my hope would be that actually in 20 years' time, we don't need to talk about transition anymore because we've done it. And that in, in 20 years, France is, is the, 
is the exemplar uh, carbon neutral country in the world. That it has led the way in terms of regenerative agriculture and different food systems and different energy models. And that actually you were the people who got into those companies and said, business as usual is not an option anymore here. Business, we, we, th this, this needs to fundamentally change. And that companies need to move from the idea of saying, we are a global company, we operate in the cloud, we are an international uh, thing, we, 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 are, we just operate in kind of on, on, on the web, to saying, no, we are, we are from this place. We operate in this place. I went to the, I gave a talk at the headquarters of Symantec, who are a big like, virus protection company, uh, just outside London. They have their offices and a big area with lots of grass, lots of lawns. And all the people who come to work with them, many of them were, are involved in transition. Many of them have children who go on the school strikes. Many of them <coughs> care really, really deeply about climate change. But when they turn up for work in the morning, they have to hang that up next to their coat and they just go and do their job. What would it be like to, to go to work in an organization whose mission was, we want to... We want to um, you know, we want to be part of, of making this happen. It would be a completely different experience. It would be about how do we uh, invest our profits back into the community around us? How do we as an organization buy as much local food, uh, local resources, local skills as possible? How do we become one of the catalysts for helping this place to do everything that it needs to do? How do we take the next generation of young people who are working in that company, who have skills around marketing and design and business planning and, 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 and send them so they go and work in the community to help that community to do all the things that it needs to do. You know, for me, we need to be moving away from the idea that, uh, that the success of companies every year is based on how much bigger than they, they are than how they were last year. I always say, you know, I have four children. If every year my children were bigger than they were the year before, that would be deeply disturbing. By the time they were as tall as this roof, I'd be really freaked out that my children had grown that big. Actually, what I want my children to do is to grow in a different way, to become kind, ideally to grow just slightly shorter than me, uh, and then to grow in other ways to become kinder and more connected and more compassionate and more skilled. And that feels to me like, you know, I, I run a, a business in my town. I run a brewery that we started five years ago. Fantastic, if you ever come to my town, come and have a beer. And uh, it was designed as a transition social enterprise brewery. Uh, fi uh, uh, last year, we turned the whole business into a 100% community-owned business. Uh, we invited the community to buy the business. 270 people now own that brewery. It works as a catalyst for using local produce for the, for the local economy. Our vision with that business is not in five years' time to be exporting cans of beer to China. Our, our vision is that actually we create a place which, is, which, which expands in different ways. It helps to start new businesses that then spin off from that. And then we create a whole ecosystem of different things that are about driving and supporting that local economy. So I'd love to see that you were the people who went into that business space and you were able to hold your ground. Going back to talking about storytelling, that you're the people who can go into that business world with a different story about how the future needs to be and how we need to start right now. We don't have any time left. There is no time left for saying, well, we could leave it another five years. That time is gone. You need to be the people going out into those organizations and saying, this is a climate emergency and we need to be acting accordingly and bringing the, bringing the stories and bringing the possibility of what it would look like instead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob.